So does this also relate to to what you teach as a finance uh, professor, like efficient market hypothesis, but then all the deviations from it? Yeah, I mean, I you know, it's a funny thing because I never love when people kind of come out and sort of say the the efficient market hypothesis is rubbish because it's not, and I think it really is is a good rule of thumb for most investors, especially if you're kind of planning on um, you know just sort of spending a, a few hours a week on your investment portfolio. It's probably a good approach just to think of things as efficient, but. The truth is, at least the really hard view of the efficient markets hypothesis doesn't necessarily stand up to a ton of scrutiny in in that we we can find all sorts of things that are unusual and that are sort of, what what can I say, like sort of special cases where they don't make sense within that context. One one of the earlier ones that was, because I graduated university very much with that EMH point of view. Mm-hmm. And I remember in, in the late 90s, there was, um, no one will remember this device, it was before the BlackBerry, there was, there was a, a device you could buy called a Palm Pilot. Do you know what that is at all? Or was it like it, the, with the, 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 um, the stylus? Exactly. It was kind of the first handheld computer. And there, there were in true terrible things, but the world got very excited about them. It was kind of pre-Blackberry smartphone kind of thing, but without a phone. And, um, but the, the, it, the company, uh, Palm Pilot, was owned by a larger uh, business called 3Com. And 3Com spun off a big chunk of Palm, maybe 40% of it or something like that, as a, a separate traded company. Or no, maybe they spun off 60% and held 40%. I forget exactly. But the value of Palm exploded like it was one of those really hot stocks in the late 1990s while 3com sort of languished and if you looked at it you you know if you bought 3com you were buying palm at maybe like a quarter of its actual price and so the funny thing was that you know you you might think like if if you were a, an advocate of the efficient markets hypothesis you might say well this is a quirky thing that happened on the side with a tiny little stock But this was something that was all over the newspapers. Like I bet there were a dozen articles in the Wall Street Journal about the puzzle of, of, you know, why is Palm doing this? And and throughout my career, you know, you just see hundreds of examples like this. Like even we'll say, for example, the the meme stock thing, like in in a truly efficient market, like in sort of any version of EMH, that wouldn't happen. And so there there are enough examples to say that things are not perfectly priced in in markets. And even a a while ago, a friend pointed out to me a a rather interesting hole in EMH is just even the idea that if, if every asset was perfectly priced within markets, there wouldn't be an insurance business, for example, because whenever you buy insurance, you're you're overpaying for an asset like in order to feel better about, you know, in order to reduce your risk or whatever. But it's not something that should necessarily exist in a purely efficient market. So I think that markets are mostly efficient. I think for most investors, it's probably reasonable to spend your time doing what you do for work in order to earn money and then invest in like passive indexes or whatever. But the the pure idea of the efficient market hypothesis doesn't really hold up to an awful lot of examination, or at least not that sort of really perfect view of EMH. Yeah. And you also mentioned like the the hard view, like, well, but with, with your example, I wonder if economists wouldn't then come up to you and say, but okay, but this is uh, different risk preferences for um, investors. Uh, so it is still efficient to have uh, that some risk averse investors want some insurance. What do you think of that? Would would that be a, a counter argument? You know, it, it's a funny thing because I think we all understand like there's no confusion as to why people buy insurance. And actually, there's not even confusion as to why people overpay for insurance. It's because, you know, essentially they're, they're in a, we'll say, for example, like if you buy a phone or something like that, and it's like a, $200 item and they charge you 50 bucks to insure it, you know, you would say, well, that's not a fair insurance premium. Why does anyone pay it? And it's like, well, the answer is that they're too lazy to, to look into other things. 
But but you know the really hard version of EMH assumes that everything is perfectly priced, that all information is encapsulated, and not just all public information, but even all private information is encapsulated in pricing. And that's not really the case. It, it just, you know, like I said, it, it, it probably doesn't, it doesn't justify everyone moving away and, and you know, becoming a, a trader for a living. But it does tell you that, um, you know, that, that there are opportunities out there for, for people who make kind of uh, cool-headed decisions. But of course, the problem is, that we all think that we make cool-headed decisions, but we tend not to. So, 